We appreciate well your version of socialism emerging from the Vedic sources. We believe in the present tumultuous situation of our country. We need such a very liberal socio-political ideal in order that peace and discipline may be restored. But such a change cannot be brought about only by talks or scripts. To actuate such concepts and to build up the social structure upon the same, it will be imperative to take active part in a political forum. The Santandal of your brand is not participating in party politics. Therefore, we intend to form a party or say a forum based on Vedic tenets of social ideology by the name of CPIV, meaning Communist Party of India Vedic. They will function well politically and in this way will be able to establish a socialistic order on Vedic lines which you are propagating with all energy. Whatever may be your advice on this idea. There is no harm if 14 parties of today sprout out to 1400. I have been telling you that a floating cloud breaks into pieces and drops out. So, you should always take care of that principle and ideal are well protected while you proceed to set up a new party or reorganize the existing one. Your viewpoint should not change opportunistically with the change of time, as we find happening nowadays. If you want to draw your future action plan on the basics of Vedic principles, then you are required to have an in-depth study and knowledge of the contents and philosophy of the Vedas. You will find today the interpretation of a particular word or hymn of the Vedic classics vary from man to man, preacher to preacher, and to some extent that common people get highly confused about the veracity of the varied texts and opinions. Every interpreter or preceptor insists on his own line of approach to the Vedic verses to be correct and true. Each one may be correct to some extent only, that is, only partly, not absolutely. None of them can be able enough to get at the true extract of the Vedic verdicts, and as a result, such half-truths and many of them become believers in God, while some others are turned into atheists. As a result, they are neither here nor there. They fall victim to half-truths only. Whatever they might have proclaimed, positive or negative, that was the outcome of their own imagination, which in due course led them to certain lines of conceptualization. In support of their respective viewpoints, they quoted selected words from the Vedas, but they had nothing to produce as direct proof of their individual contentions. The Vedas stand for knowledge. You will find their assertions were based on reason. The concepts were scientific. Nothing is imaginary or hypothetical. The message, concept and philosophy emanating from the Vedas are all based upon objective realism. There is nothing fanciful or beyond comprehension. There's no specific mention even of God as such. Neither do we find deities like the godlike having been used by them. According to the Vedas, different elements of nature are constantly rendering beneficial service to mankind, and as such, those are godlike to man. The Vedas advised man to go on analyzing and deciphering all different aspects of nature. Don't come to a decision or conclusion in a haste. Proceed from the particular to the general. Begin with objects of sensual experience, just as you see, hear, feel, physically and go deep, analyzing your experiences so that you may arrive at some conclusion. On that basis only you can give your verdict, not before that. You need to substantiate with reasoning, facts, 
and prove your statement that the worldly matters are unreal and only Brahma is the essence. The reverse will also not hold good without the fundamental support of reason and proof. Whatever you find substantial as a result of your analysis, research and experiment, which must be beyond any doubt and hesitation, produce substance and offer to the society. You then will feel satisfaction to see that your findings have been recognized and accepted by the people. There won't be any gain before all your exercise is completed. You may also test your finding and decisions on the touchstone of the Vedic principles and formulate your action plans on that basis. Many social ills and problems will then be sorted out. Pressed between two different extremist forces today, India receded far away from the true principles of the Vedas. Believers and non-believers, representatives of these two groups, are trying hard to interpret and make the best use of the two concepts laid down in the Vedas. The worldly life is true on one side, and on the other, an earnestness for something beyond what's at hand. The votaries of both the ways are vying with each other for resting optimum self-interest and even stooping low to the level of the antisocials. If you intend to form an organization, you should take care to discard both kinds of persuasion. To elucidate and tell you my observations, Believers in God would, after careful analysis of the nature of things rolling in the universe, in a very orderly and harmonious manner, admit the existence of some superpowers conducting all worldly activities. So their thought process and line of thinking proceeds from the supra stage far beyond the materials of the world. The theme of their query and research relates to the entire creation as well as the Creator, but they could hardly come to any final say. Yet another group of self-interested preachers would always try to take advantage of the simplicity of the common people and thrust upon them some twisted versions of the solemn treatises and introduce varieties of rituals or sacrificial offerings out of the lurking fear of the imaginary hell and all such perils propagated by the greedy and exploitative preachers. It's now very difficult to remove all superstitions from the people's mind. Consequently, all efforts to instill in them the sublime vision and the lessons of the Vedas are falling through because people are powerless to come out of the cocoons of imposed mannerisms. When the wings are loaded, how can they fly freely? Now, it is necessary to induce them to emancipate themselves from the bonds of superstitions and to take voyage with fresh energy. It requires much patience and untiring labor to achieve the noble objective. The organization that you have now proposed should take the responsibility of this Herculean task. But that's the risk of the people's revolt when their long-cherished customary faith is shaken. In fact, they are in a sense votaries of the Vedas. Whatever they do in the name of religious rites like puja, yagya, devotional offerings, etc. come from Vedic teachings, as they have been told. People have been assured of joy and happiness in the present birth. These are religious norms, nothing else. So they have been taught. Now your task will be to rescue them from all such illusory concepts and show to them the right path to the truth. But remember, the task is not easy because as much as you may persuade them to give up their absurd ideas, they won't respond so very promptly. And again, in spite of your efforts, 
they will not promptly come forward to adopt the way that you will advocate. It is better for you to work as a social analyst first. You measure up the level of the people's ideas and aspirations. You confine your efforts up to that much only and proceed on by analyzing and explaining within their range of understanding. On your side too, you keep yourself within the bounds of your knowledge and perception. You need not discuss with your disciples about any divinity or God until you are totally convinced of the existence of the Divine Self and you are in a position to convince others about the same. You are to perceive justice and dutifulness as the essence of religion. That much will be sufficient. The majority of the people in our country are God-lovers and believers, but at times of any danger or serious problem, they rush to external health in preference to divine force of their faith, as they have no comprehension or existence of a super-authority they cannot depend on the abstract and as a result they suffer from indecision. It leads to various problems and complications. In a situation where it would be possible to justify the existence of God by any evidence and proof, then people would rest in faith and peace and reliance. Then our society and the country as a whole would assume a new appearance and adopt a very new line of approach to all activities. Unfortunately, the scene is just the contrary today. Taking advantage of people's faith in God, the Supreme, a large group of self-centered exploiters are found busy in a self-run interest even if the country goes to doom. This evil must be destroyed to the very roots. This unholy class is my real target, not the theist faith as such. It is a matter of deep concern that a large number of temples, sanctuaries, prayer halls are coming up across the country and countless religious headmen are posing as dignitaries, assuming surnames like Babaji, Brahmachari and the like. Their real objective is to exploit the community where the common people are believers and God-fearing. I don't like to hurt their faith and morale. My concern is their safety and welfare, and so I would like to issue a signal of warning. Our society is now in a tottering condition. Problem and corruption are now aplenty on all fronts of the society, be it food, finance, education, religion, material life or spiritual life. No sign of success and solution on any issue that we may feel proud of. Helpless and hapless common people are living their cursed life for centuries. They are being duped and exploited by the clever and exploiting section. The conformists of the Vedas also decry this. None of us would like to indulge in a debate about God. We can't confirm or deny. It all depends upon evidence. This is the stand of the Vedas. We need to be convinced of the truth. As we are certain about the terms, birth and death, so also we must be definite about the existence of God, the Super, Heaven and Hell, sin and virtue. We ourselves must first be convinced of the veracity of the claim over these themes. Only then we can take up real work on appropriate times and also ask people to function on prescribed proper lines. Mere faith is an omniscient God or in destiny does not solve man's problem or cure man's ill. Had it been so, then man would live in eternal happiness because of the all-merciful God. We would then have had enough satisfaction. But the tragedy lies 
in the never-ending strife and stress engulfing the society today. The harsh role of destiny is to create imbalance in the society and to deprive man even of two square meals. People are suffering silently on the plea of an all-powerful, irrevocable destiny. In this way, all have been rendered spineless. They have lost the spirit of revolt and challenge. Their cunning gurus are putting all blame squarely on them for their ritualistic frailties, coming down even from previous births. People have no answer. They have to admit their unknown follies and undergo all sorts of penance, prayers, gifts, and other offerings for the appeasement of the unkind fate. This is how the society is now breaking down by gross corrosion. The Vedic scholars asserted that it was a crime for those who caused harm and disaster to the society, and it was equally an offence if that was not opposed. That's the situation prevailing in our society today. Your duty will be to uproot all those elements who are exploiting the people in the name of God and religion. They should be asked to produce evidence of what they preach and proclaim, or else they must withdraw. Slow poisoning of the society won't be tolerated anymore. So, you overtake them all and reach the people at the grassroots. Devote yourselves to practical work and productive labor, like plowing the field. Go to the different areas in villages, towns and suburbs. Do labor, produce and consume. According to the Vedas, physical labor provides the foundation of the society. So, you should not rest and enjoy at the cost of others. As regards faith in God, I would like to tell you that the Vedas are neither assertive nor negative on this. If the believers can produce conclusive proof of divine existence, you should admit and accept that readily. That will be the turning point in your pilgrim's progress. A different section in our society who claim to be non-believers of any super-authority as God, or so, won't bother over the issue. For them, the materialistic world was all. That matters. These materialistic enthusiasts masterminded various schemes and plans to serve their own self-interest unscrupulously. Since, in their opinion, no morality was called for because there was no God or virtue or sin to restrict them. Enjoyment and pleasure in the present life became all important to them. They are resorting to unscrupulous, even nefarious and unlawful means to achieve their selfish objectives. Cases of indiscipline, ugly disputes are cropping up due to their offensive conduct. It is entirely a unilateral assertion on their part to proclaim that there was no heed to bother for consequences of licentious activities, as there is none to question them and control them with moral authority. They are absorbed in the irrevocable assumption that there is nothing beyond the existing lifeline, but their thought process stands null and void for want of convincing arguments and evidence. They suffer from a kind of superstition because of an unacceptable rigid stand on life. Please remember that I am not against a materialistic social system, nor am I decrying those who are truly materialistic. Credit is due to them as they adhere to their materialistic approach and their contribution to social welfare and development is also praiseworthy. That's how science has achieved so much progress. They are going ahead with investigation and research. I stand by their side. 
My debate is against those mean-minded groups of people who work under the play of materialistic existentialism, but wreck humanity, destroy people's moral and tender qualities. They are nonetheless obstinate in their unholy adherence to acquisitiveness at the cost of the simpler folk in our society. Sentiment, faith in virtues and morality have very little value to them. An antisocial group is taking advantage of this situation and creating disruption in society. There can't be any progress in development in such a situation. My advice to you all is to avoid both the elements, empiricists and materialists, so that neither can influence you by their evil designs. Then again, it is important for you to remember that the twin concepts of primordialism and realism are not to be wished away or disowned or branded baseless. Neither has achieved finality or perfection. You are to watch and wait till the culmination of either of the two lines of approach. You keep yourself bound within the limits of your capability. What's the good of getting involved in matters beyond your ilk? Follow your own conviction. Don't falter. Engage yourself in the tasks of good against bad, benign against malign. Forsake all thoughts on holy or sinful. That's all wastage of energy. Be careful in discharging your duties that the services rendered by you will ultimately benefit yourselves as well as the society at large. Your prime concern should be your country marching towards heavenly bliss and not hellish afflictions. This is the sure way for the solution of the critical problems our society is facing today. I'm afraid both these two trends will try to cast influence upon you, so be alert and keep on the right track. Be truth seekers, don't be biased. Your choice of spiritualism or materialism will depend on convincing evidence to your satisfaction. You are to remain free from bogged down ideas and superstition. This can be done in either of the two ways, one of love and understanding and the other of revolution. If the goal must be achieved by love, well and good, still you must be prepared for revolution as well. Take up arms if necessary and apply the same to destroy the forces of evil that are in either of the two groups, yes or no. Both are equally vulnerable. You are to inflict dire punishment to them with equal force.